A book has not made me cry like this in a very long time. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Then walks in the handsome property manager. It gets dystopian and sci-fi real quick. Hello friends and fellow readers. Welcome, welcome on in. I hope you're doing well today. I can't believe it's the end of January 23 already. Uh, this month simultaneously felt like it lasted 12 years and also only an hour. I don't know if it felt like that for anyone else, um, but my name is Julie. I'm an artist and illustrator, and usually I do art on this channel, but lately reading has meant a lot to me. It's given me lots of inspiration. I have a book club in my Discord, and it's been so nice to talk to you all on there. And I thought, why don't I just make a video about reading? <laughs> So, um, I'm going to talk about my January reads in this video. I read 15 books this month, kind of spanning all sorts of genres. I, I love fantasy, that's my favorite. Romance is my least favorite, <laughs> but I'm trying to enjoy it more by reading the right things. And I also really like uh, literary fiction. I like to really dive deep into uh, the messages the authors are trying to convey. And also, um, a little sci-fi here and there, but fantasy is definitely my favorite. Um, but each month I kind of try to uh, tackle on my TBR, which has all sorts of genres on there. And of course I'm always getting recommendations from friends and our book club. So in this video, I want to begin and end on a high note. So I'll be starting with the books that I enjoyed. They were fine, they were good. Uh, and then I'll move into books that maybe didn't quite hit the mark for me, were a little disappointing, or just I straight up didn't enjoy them. And then we'll end with the ones that I absolutely loved, feel really passionate about. And we're not gonna spend a lot of time on the ones I didn't like because I truly think there's a book out there for everybody. And just because I didn't like it doesn't mean you won't. And also I would rather just talk about things that I like and really enjoy and feel passionate about. I hate spoilers, so you can feel safe with me. I'm not going to spoil anything for you. If I ever go on a spoiler rant, I will definitely tell you what timestamp to jump to. Um, so don't worry about that here. Just quick plot summaries and my thoughts and feelings. So yeah, we'll do good, uh, disappointing, great. And then um, towards the end, I will talk about our February book club theme and pick. And I'll also share some of the January 2023 releases that I'm excited about. So with that, let's get started. Grab your coffee, your tea, a blanket, um, cozy up with me, or if you have a chore you've been putting off, you know which one I'm talking about. Why don't you just throw me on in the background and get that done? I'm so proud of you, you got this. All right, so to start off this section of good books, I usually rate on a metric of one to 10. So think of these books in that seven to eight range. And I want to start with The Dragon's Promise by Elizabeth Lim. This is the second book in the Six Crimson Cranes duology. So it's now a completed duology. Aren't these covers absolutely stunning? Oh my gosh. I bought um, this book before I even read the first one before I even finished it because they're just absolutely beautiful. They have a gorgeous map in the front. Let me show you. Absolutely beautiful. So this story, um, book one, follows Princess Shiori. It's a YA fantasy. Did I say that? I'll put everything um, about the genre, the page number, um, and a little graphic off to the side. But we follow Princess Shiori. Um, she has six brothers, six older brothers. Uh, she's very spunky. She gets in trouble a lot as uh, younger siblings do. Her best friend is a paper crane she bought, brought to life and can telepathically communicate with named Kiki. I love Kiki. She's one of my favorite parts of the book. Um, she's so funny. Shiori hasn't always gotten along with her stepmother. There are some family secrets uh, magic has kind of disappeared and waned from the kingdom, but now it's kind of coming back. Sorcery isn't really a topic people like to talk about. You know, they have their sacred sites and their rituals, 
uh, but magic is kind of a no-no and Shiori realizes that she is magical. So she goes on this journey and book two picks up on that journey. So I don't want to say too much. I don't want to give any spoilers, um, but it was really exciting because in book two, she got to go to a lot of the different places that we didn't get to see her go to in book one. She went to uh, the islands where her stepmother grew up. She went to the dragon kingdom and it's all just so magical. I absolutely love the setting and the magic system that Elizabeth Lim has created. Um, a lot of it was inspired by Chinese myths and folklore and legends, and you really get that like ancient folklore feeling when you read these. It's so nostalgic, and I absolutely love the magic system. The writing is sometimes not quite up to par. I think this book especially gets really choppy at times. Um, Elizabeth Lim doesn't really go into super detail. She lets you, the reader, really use their imagination a lot. Um, but I think the book could actually benefit from some more descriptions uh, to kind of smoothly flow into uh, action to action because it gets kind of choppy and um, get a little bit of whiplash at points. <laughs> so I wish there were a bit more descriptions um, just because I do love the world so much. But besides that, it was still a good story. Not quite as strong as book one, but I really loved the ending. Um, it made me tear up a bit. So, very good series. Uh, she recently announced that she is coming out with another book um, called, what's it called? Let me check. Her Radiant Curse. Uh, she announced the title back in December. The cover has not been revealed yet. I hope it's by the same illustrator. Fingers crossed. But that book will focus on uh, the stepmother of Shiori when she was younger because there's still so many secrets uh, we don't know about, uh, about her. So I'm really excited to dive in deeper with that character. The next book I want to talk about is The School for Good Mothers. I get a lot of my books from the library on Libby and then have them sent to my Kindle. So I'll be showing probably most of my books uh, here on my Kindle. So sorry I don't have all the pretty covers to look at, um, but I'll put the official covers over here in this graphic. The School for Good Mothers follows Frida, who is uh, a recent, she recently became a mom. She's in her early 30s, I believe. And it opens with her talking about this one bad day. She keeps referring to this day as her one bad day. And we realize that that day she just needed to run to grab a coffee. She hadn't slept in a couple of days. Um, and then she realized she needed an article that she left at work that she needed to bring home. So she runs to the office, starts doing emails, loses track of time. Um, and essentially leaves her baby alone at the house for three hours. A neighbor heard the baby crying and called Child Protection Services on her, um, and so she has been separated from her baby at this point. It's very heartbreaking. Um, this book is very sad. <laughs> this book has some fantastic messages, um, but yes, it's very sad. <laughs> So when she goes to court to see if she can have her baby back, she loses, but she gets offered uh, the chance to try out a new program, School for Good Mothers, um, where essentially if she successfully graduates that program, she can be with her child again. So she's like, of course, why Why wouldn't I <laughs> grab at any chance? And it gets dystopian and uh, sci-fi real quick. I'm not gonna spoil it for you, um, but it does get quite disturbing, it gets very dark. Um, please, please, please read the content warning tags on this one. Um, I think this book has so many good things to say. The message kind of really hits you in the face. I think it's absolutely incredible. I love the sci-fi bits that were added in. I think it kind of just drives home uh, some of the points that Jessamyn Chan was making. Um, but yes, please read the content warnings. I did, I think I rated this like an eight because I truly don't think I can read it ever again. And usually nines and tens, I'm like, yes, yes, I want to read it again, like as soon as possible. It just is so dark and disturbing. While I appreciate the message, it's heavy, so. But yes, highly recommend if you're in the right headspace. I think this book has some incredible things to say. 
Next is Love on the Brain by Allie Hazelwood. This is the same writer that did The Love Hypothesis, which is so famous. It's all over book talk and bookstagram. Uh, it's romance, so I was trying something a little bit outside of my comfort zone. Uh, I actually read uh, The Love Hypothesis back in December and didn't love it. I just didn't think it was realistic at all. I don't really enjoy the fake dating trope that much, and especially the situation in Love Hypothesis seemed even more unrealistic to me. But I can't tell you enough how much I really enjoyed Love on the Brain. I think I read it in two sittings. It's so stinking cute. I love the main character. Her name is B. She is a neuroscientist for astronauts. She's working on a new helmet for astronauts, which is just so cool. It's I, I love the science aspect uh, of this book. I think it's so interesting. Uh, but essentially, B realizes that her college rival uh, is going to be her partner on this new project that she's doing for NASA. So of course, chaos ensues. Uh, there's some great side characters. I laughed out loud. I can't even tell you how many times. This book had me kicking my feet and giggling. It was so stinking cute and I, I just couldn't stop laughing. I thought B was so relatable. You could really root for her. I love the relationship she had with her sister. Um, her sister lives in another country and so she always is trying to FaceTime her and it was so cute to see them connect and have that healthy relationship. And also Hazelwood was able to incorporate some great messages about women and minorities in STEM. So I think it's totally great that she was able to talk about that within a romance setting. So yeah, if you like romance and you especially you didn't like Love Hypothesis, maybe try this one uh, because this one definitely worked for me. Highly recommend this one. Very cute. Then we have Nine Liars by Maureen Johnson. I listened to the audiobook for this one. That's why it's here on my phone. This is book five in the Truly Devious series and I've listened to the audiobooks for all of them. I love the narrator who does the audiobooks. I think she's absolutely great. Nine Liars follows Stevie Bell and crew over to London. Uh, so this is really fun. The first three Truly Devious really are a trilogy. It kind of follows the same mystery and it kind of finishes up with book three. Then book four is like Stevie and crew go to uh, summer camp and then this book is oh Stevie and crew go to London so it's really cool to see them in a new place um, especially a new country. The mystery definitely took a back seat compared to the other books I think which is fine but if you want a very mystery forward story this one might not be for you. Stevie and the gang are all reaching uh, are all getting closer to graduation time so they're all thinking about leaving their friends and how hard of a transition that is and applying to colleges and uh, helping each other with applications. So I think it's very relatable. Uh, I would have loved this book uh, senior and junior year in high school. What I love about Maureen Johnson is she writes dialogue in situations that are so realistic to teenagers. There's nothing more I hate in books than teenagers not talking like teenagers and I think uh, Maureen Johnson does this so well. It, it reminds me of how me and my friends would talk. It just seems realistic to me. So Stevie is still coping with her anxiety. We've seen her go through um, like trying med medication and therapy throughout the books. Um, she has her relationship with David and they've had to do long distance for a while so it kind of gets into the nitty-gritty of their relationship. So as for the mystery, I don't think it was anything special. <laughs> it's historic mystery just like some of the other ones where she's trying to solve mystery from the past so it goes back and forth in perspectives between Stevie current day trying to solve the mystery and then when the crime actually happened. It was fun. It was fun. Um, I look forward to seeing where Stevie and crew go next. I didn't love Inheritance Games. I, I was not a big fan of the Inheritance Games series and it's also the same genre YA mystery. But I, I really love Truly Devious, so maybe if you didn't like Inheritance Games either, maybe try this one, because um, this one was, was definitely more up my alley as well. But always just a good time. They're quick listens, quick reads. Uh, Stevie's really funny, really relatable. Um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about uh, this one, except that the mystery uh, wasn't as wasn't as prevalent and important in this book, I'll say that. Now we have another romance. Kiss Her Once For Me 
<laughs> this is a holiday rom-com. I know what you're thinking, why are you reading holiday books in January? Well, I tried to download a bunch of really cute and fun romance and rom-coms for December. I was going on vacation and I thought, well, maybe I'll like romance more if I'm in the right setting. But unfortunately, none of my holds came in on time. <laughs> So I think like the second week in January, all my Christmas books are ready and I no longer was in the Christmassy mood. But I decided to keep one and this is the one I chose to keep and I'm glad I did. It was very cute. Kiss Her Once For Me follows um, Elena, she also goes by Ellie or Elle, who recently last year moved to Portland away from her toxic relationship with her mom. She moved over to Portland to have her dream job at Leica Studios. Uh, she studied animation. This is her absolute dream job. Um, but unfortunately, after just, I think, two or three months, she has to be let go. Um, so she's really devastated about that. She always talks about how she's such a planner. She had a 10-year plan for her life, but everything fell apart and now she's scrambling for what to do. Her mom is constantly asking her for money. Her mom won't come visit her for holidays or Christmas or anything. Um, so she really is alone in Portland, trying, just trying to survive. Uh, she's currently a barista and her boss isn't the best. <laughs> He's not very nice. She's tried to pick up other jobs because her rent is about to increase but her boss is not flexible at all. So she can't keep the second job. She loses the second job. Well, one Christmas, last Christmas, haha, -ha, so many, there's so many Christmas puns in this book, just so you know. Last Christmas, she had this one perfect day with a stranger that she met named Jack. And we learn about this one special day through a web comic that Ellie makes. And here is the part I wish they had done in the book better. I wish they had done the webcomic as an actual comic. I wish they had gotten an artist to do a graphic novel type panels for this. I think it would have added so much to the story. So each chapter kind of goes back and forth. We'll switch to the webcomic to see what happened last Christmas with this stranger and then we'll go to present day what's happening now. We slowly learn that, oh, that one perfect day, that was it. She never made communication with that person again. She thinks about Jack all the time, but it just didn't work out. So now, one day, <laughs> she is desperate for money. Her mom is begging her constantly to send her money. Uh, she just lost that second job. Uh, her, she's trying to get a raise from her boss at the coffee shop, and the boss says no. Then walks in the handsome property manager who asks her on a date. Well, they go get drinks, they get to talking, they start opening up over drinks, and he tells her that his grandfather recently passed away, and of course is leaving him this huge inheritance. But there's one condition, he has to get married. And she's like, whoa, that's so crazy. My secret is that I'm super poor and I'm about to lose everything. <laughs> so they make a pact. She is going to be his fiance. And in turn, they'll be married for a year. She'll get 10% of this inheritance, which is like a million dollars. So she'll get $200,000. And he said, okay, I have one more condition for you. You have to come to my family Christmas with me. We have to keep up appearances. We have to convince my family that this is real. So she agrees because who wouldn't for $200,000? Very handsome man, why not? Well, she goes to the family house and I'm not gonna tell you anymore because that would spoil so many things. <laughs> There's so many cliches in this book. It's so tropey. Um, it's very Christmassy. It's very Hallmark movie, but it is LGBTQ. Uh, there's a great non-binary character. There's a trans character. So it's very inclusive that way. It's just fun. It's quick. Um, Ella's funny. Uh, yeah, there's nothing special. It's just cute. It's fun. I wish I'd read it over the holidays, but <laughs> oh well, maybe next time. Next, I read Queen of Shadows. I'm not gonna spend a long time 
on Throne of Glass because Book Talk, Bookstagram, Booktube is so oversaturated with Sarah J Maas content. So all I'm going to say about this book is the prequel and the first three books were really hard for me to get through. Um, as I said, I, I love fantasy. That's my absolute favorite genre. I come from a background of very high fantasy, uh, Robin Hobb, George R. R. Martin, Tolkien, Lewis, and so coming from that to Throne of Glass, I found really frustrating. I didn't think the world building was great. I, I didn't feel like I could root for any of the characters. Uh, I know so many people love these books, but the first four just were not for me. <laughs> However, Queen of Shadows, it's either book four or five, depending on what order you read them in, uh, is the first time I actually felt connected to some of the characters and actually cared what happened to them. <laughs> I thought the addition of some new characters was interesting. Um, we got to learn more about Manon. We got to meet Nesrin, who I really love. What else happened? Oh, Lysandra or Lysandra. I love that girl. I loved her inclusion of the character. I think she's a great foil. Not really a foil, but a great friend uh, for Aelin. Aelin needed a girlfriend. <laughs> my, my issue with these books is I just don't like Aelin very much. Um, I think she can be so snobby and I don't know, it's hard for me to root for her. But this book was the first time I felt like I actually cared. Um, it was nice seeing her and Adion together. So yeah, that's all I'll say about this. Obviously I can't say much or I'll spoil it. <laughs> or make people angry. <laughs> so let's move on. Next is Empire of Storms and Tower of Dawn. I'm doing these two together because I actually read them at the same time. I did a tandem read and I followed the graph by T.L. TL Branson, I believe. Thank you so much, Branson. It's incredible. I'm so glad I did this tandem read because each book follows different characters, but it's happening at the same time. And this reading guide helps you read them at the same time, just absolutely seamlessly. So it feels like her other books. Definitely my favorite in the series so far, Tower of Dawn. I know this is controversial. It's my favorite one so far. I obviously only have Kingdom of Ash left, but I loved Tower of Dawn. I loved the setting. I love Nesrin and Sartak. I think is how you say it. Sartak, Sartak. Um, I love Irene. I think Irene is a great character. It was great to see some actual growth in Kale's uh, character development. So yeah, Tower of Dawn, definitely my favorite so far. Queen of Shadows was fun too. There were some great battle scenes. Still kind of missed the mark for me. Uh, I get really frustrated with how Aelin doesn't tell anyone anything, and I felt this way about Resand too in um, Akatar. I just got so frustrated, especially with with Aelin, because you know she has friends who are immortal, are hundreds of years old. They're battle strategists, they're warriors, and she's 19 and doesn't ask them for help. Which I guess that is kind of on par for a teenager. But I'm like, oh my gosh. People are there to help you. Just let them help you. And she never does. The ending of Empire of Storms is absolutely bonkers. It, you, have to, you have to suspend so much disbelief. Uh, but if you can, it's fun. Uh, just don't think too hard about it. <laughs> it's not very believable. Um, but it is enjoyable. So that's all I, I'll say about those. All right. Now we're going to move on to the books that just didn't quite hit the mark for me. These books were all disappointing or I just didn't enjoy them very much. So we're gonna start with Eleanor and, Eleanor and Park. I read so much Rainbow Rowell when I was in high school, so I'm not sure how I missed this one because this I remember this one coming out, um, but for some reason I just never read it. So I listened to the audiobook for this one and oh my goodness, it was just like a bad hang. <laughs> it just made me so sad. Um, definitely read the content warnings for this one. It follows Eleanor, who comes from a very poor family. Her stepdad is incredibly abusive. Um, her mom is awful. Um, she struggles 
with her body image and has to deal with lots of fat phobic people. So that wasn't fun. <laughs> um, and Park, his mother was Korean and he had a lot of internal racism that just never really got resolved or discussed further in the book and it just didn't sit well with me. I think I think Rainbow Rowell just did not handle this character very well. There, there are so many articles about this that say it way more eloquently than I do, but it just left a bad feeling in my stomach. When it wasn't focused on the abuse, <laughs> it focused on a typical teenage romance, the back and forth of do you like me? Do you think I'm pretty? Do you think this? It just got so repetitive and it was honestly exhausting. I just felt bad for the characters. All the adults in this book are horrible. The audiobook is just under nine hours long and I think it took me 11 days to listen to. I had to force myself to keep going back. Um, so yeah, maybe I would have liked this more in high school. I know a lot of people do love this book, but it just... It wasn't fun, like it just made me feel so bad. So yeah, I'm sorry if you really liked this book, but for those reasons, I can't recommend it to you. Next we have Portrait of a Thief. Ugh, y'all. I was so excited for this book. I was an art history minor, so whenever art gets brought into books, I am absolutely thrilled. Uh, this book was marketed as a thriller heist Ocean's Eleven type book and it really fell flat. The basic story follows um, some college students that get recruited by a company in China to go steal back these relics from art museums and bring these Chinese artifacts to come home. Love that idea. I think that's so cool. I was so excited to learn about these artifacts. Like as an art history minor, I'm like, tell me more. Tell me who made it, tell me what dynasty, tell me what year it was made, what's the materials, tell me everything. So in theory, I should love this book. My main qualm with this book is how it was marketed. It should not be marketed as a thriller. <laughs> there is nothing thrilling or exciting about this book. I don't understand how you can call it anything close to um, Ocean's Eleven. I was expecting like really cool behind the scenes of a heist with all these like twists and turns and people doing cool stuff, but there's none of that. Literally one of the heists is someone unlocking a door and another person stealing a hard drive. Like that's it. <laughs> so not exciting at all. Um, so that was disappointing. That was my biggest gripe. If it had just not been marketed that way, I wouldn't have been expecting it, you know? The second problem with this book is it had so much potential and it wanted to talk about so many different things, which I think is great. It mentioned BLM movement, it mentioned public protesting, uh, Chinese diaspora, uh, immigration, colonialism. It like touched on so many great things, but I think overall it was trying to do too much and so it fell short of all of them so yeah just really disappointing i at first i thought the writing was good but when i took a step back i realized each chapter was kind of formatted the exact same way like opened with the weather and then the student doing some sort of work and then they get a call from another person in the heist and then they think to themselves oh what will life be like after the heist what was life like before the heist and it was like every chapter was the exact same and you just get instead of the plot progressing you're just inside these people's heads so i was just really disappointed if you want a book recommendation that does have thrilling elements is kind of a heist touches on a lot of similar messages and has dark academia vibes which Portrait of Thieves try to do all those things. Just read Babel by R.F. Quang because it, it does all those things really well. I think this was uh, Lee's very first book, so maybe the next book will be better. You know, debut books can kind of be hit or miss um, because there was so much potential there. I think all the ideas were so great. Um, it just it just really fell flat, unfortunately. Okay, the last meh 
book we're gonna talk about is Hidden Pictures. This one really surprised me because it won a Goodreads award. It was like the Goodreads People's Choice. Um, and I've heard so many good things and so many people talked about it. Uh, I will say it started off very strong. Um, we follow Mallory, who is a recovering drug addict. She's trying to get her life back together. Um, and she becomes a nanny for this very well-off family. I will say what I liked about this book is I thought I thought the writing was good. It flowed very seamlessly. And I thought the elements of the pictures were really fun. It shows a bunch of children's drawing, very typical tropey <laughs> thriller movie. But I thought it was I thought those two things were successful. Um, started off strong. It does get crazier and crazier and just kind of not believable as time goes on. There's lots of thriller tropes in here. I read it in one sitting uh, because whenever there's a child involved in a thriller, I have to make sure that they're okay. <laughs> um, so I was really stressed out about the well-being of this child. But unfortunately, there were some characters that would say some really like offhanded random things that were like really racist or just like awful stereotypes and the message at the end felt pretty transphobic and weird and it just made me not feel good. So I, th I think that there's some pretty harmful rhetoric in this book that was not handled well um, and I'm very confused by it. And if you wanna read more about it, you can read some one-star reviews on Goodreads. So with all that being said, I cannot recommend this to you. Yeah, I know a lot of people love this. I mean, obviously it won the Goodreads Choice Awards, but that really surprised me and honestly kind of concerns me. So yeah, just not for me. There's a lot of other thrillers out there um, that don't have harmful messages like this one that are better, so. <laughs> Go read those instead. All right, now, now that we got all the bad stuff out of the way, <laughs> we can focus on the things that I absolutely loved, starting with The Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School. This book is told from the perspective of Yami. She is a high school student, and it focuses a lot on her family dynamics. She has a younger brother. She has a, a kind of a tumultuous relationship with her mom. They're trying to figure things out um, and she, her favorite person in the world is her dad. Unfortunately, a couple of years ago, her dad was deported back to Mexico, but her favorite thing of each week is getting to FaceTime him. So that's really sweet seeing her get to have that relationship with her dad. But it follows Yami. She recently came out to her best friend who proceeded to then out her and shame her. So not only did she lose a best friend, but she kind of lost that trust and was shamed for it. And her brother keeps getting into so much trouble at school. He's constantly getting into fights. So their mom decides to pull them out of that school and let them go to a Catholic school. And at first she was just going to make her son go, but because Yami was recently outed. She no longer wants to go to that school either. So she begs her mom, please let me go to that Catholic school too. Um, I can look after my brother. It'll be great for both of us. Her mom's like, okay, you can go, but I don't have enough money for tuition for both of you. So you're gonna have to make up um, that tuition money and, and work hard to earn your tuition. And Yami's like, I'll literally do anything. Like, please just get me out of that horrible place. So she starts helping her mom, uh, her mom's Etsy shop. It's a very cute, I also have an Etsy shop, so I, I understand a lot of the ins and outs of it. So it was really cute to see Yami help her mom uh, blow up on TikTok and try and market her work. She does the, these beautiful, like traditional uh, Mexican beadwork, gorgeous. She helps her mom with that. She gets to go to a new school. Uh, the relationship with her and her brother is kind of back and forth. They're keeping a lot of secrets from each other. Um, Yami gets a new crush at that school. It's a very diverse book. Um, it, it's very hopeful. It leaves you with the feeling um, that things can get better, uh, even when things get really, really bad. Uh, definitely look up the 
uh, content warnings for this one. It's YA though, so there's no like spice or smut or anything. It's very sweet. Um, Yami is hilarious. This book had me laughing out loud so many times. But yeah, it's just a really sweet book. It was nominated for the National Book Awards and I totally see why. I absolutely loved it. I would recommend it to literally everyone. <laughs> Talks about immigration, racism, homophobia, all sorts of great topics um, and things that high schoolers have to deal with every day also. So great coming of age story. Um, just really sweet. I think you'll really like it. Then we have Legends and Lattes. <laughs> Y'all, if you are in need of a warm hug, just read this book. It is so sweet, especially if you love fantasy, if you love D&D, if you just like slice of life books, this is for you. There's baking, there's thrifting, there's making coffee, there's a giant cuddly cat, there's a rat who wears an apron named Thimble who makes pastries every day for a living. Oh my goodness, it's just so sweet. I can't recommend it enough. I read it in one sitting. It's adorable. We follow Liv, Liv, Liz, Liv, <laughs> who recently retired from adventuring. She's an orc. She's trying to figure out how to live her life slowly. She's sworn off murdering. She's sworn off heisting. She's just gonna open a coffee shop and she's gonna do it really well. Um, it's just so stinking sweet. There's sapphic romance. There's uh, no spite or smut in this one either. Um, it's adorable. Uh, Thimble made me want to cry. He's so cute. <laughs> Someone please draw Thimble and tag me so I can see it. Thank you. Now we have Now Is Not The Time To Panic. And this is Kevin Wilson's most recent book. I listened to the audiobook for this one. Uh, it's only like six hours long, so it's a quick read. Uh, I listen to it just doing things around the house. We follow Frankie, who is the youngest of three brothers, triplets. Um, she's really quiet. She feels kind of like she doesn't really fit in anywhere. She wants to be a writer. And one summer, she meets a boy named Zeke. Well, they get together, they start hanging out over the summer, and they decide to make a poster. The poster has something that she wrote and things that he designed and drew, and they start hanging up the poster all over town. Well, things get a little crazy. People aren't sure what the message of the poster means. They think it could be the Illuminati. They think it could be cults or gang-related, all this stuff. And then this phenomenon happens where the poster starts popping up in other cities and even other countries. Things get well out of hand. So it's just an interesting look into not only the creative collaboration process, but also how once you put your art out into the world, how it's perceived and understood and the meaning is completely beyond your control anymore. Once it's out there, it's out there. People can perceive it however they want to, even if they can perceive it wrong. So it's really interesting in how the effect that art has on people. Um, I loved the creative collaboration aspect of it and how working on the same thing can mean two completely different things to different people. Um, and we kind of go back and forth with Frankie. She's now an adult and she's never told anyone that she and Zeke made the poster, but someone figured it out and they're calling her and they want to interview her. Uh, it's like 30 years later or something. I loved how it talked about the expression of art and how important it is. Um, yeah, I just, I thought it was so well written. And I will say this too, I was so impressed. Jennifer Goodwin does the narration for this book. And it is one of the few times where I think the narration of a voice actor really improved the book for me. Her performance was incredible. <laughs> like, she was Frankie. Um, she did such a great job. So I would actually really recommend listening to the audiobook. I think she really understood Frankie and just truly brought her to life. Um, I was very impressed by her performance. So yeah, I would love to reread this book someday. Um, it, it even talks about mental health and it does get a little dark at times, but overall just super interesting and the characters do get closure at the end, which I was really concerned about. So if you're concerned about that too, don't worry. 
everyone gets closure. It's going to be okay. I also thought the mom character was excellent. There's not a lot of times where like I see my relationship with my mom in media and I thought this one really represented it very well. Um, she always turned to her mom for help and advice or comfort even when she's in her 30s. Yeah, it was just really sweet. Uh, I, I really loved the character of the mom. So yeah, really enjoyed this one. Uh, now's not the time to panic. I can't wait to reread it someday. Last but certainly not least is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Hello darkness, my old friend. <sighs> Y'all. This is the only book I gave a 10 out of 10 this month. I read it with my book club. Um, and I feel like I highlighted the entire book. <laughs> I had so many quotes and so many things to underline. This book follows uh, Sam and Sadie from the time that they're really young. Um, they're around middle school age when we meet them and we see them into, into their, um, their 30s, maybe even 40s, I believe. Sadie's sister, Alice, it has cancer. So she's always in the hospital visiting her sister. And Sam was in a horrible car accident that really messed up his foot. Like his foot was completely crushed. And so they, he has to do so many surgeries all the time. So he's in and out of the hospital constantly. They meet while he's playing video games in the entertainment room in the hospital. Um, and they quickly form a friendship uh, playing video games together. And I, I just love, <laughs> I feel like this book explained the nostalgia of video games so well and how so many of us turn to video games when we're needing like a pick-me-up or just to kind of escape from our world for a little bit. It's just so good. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil it, but essentially they grew up and start making video games together. So it's also a look into the creative collaboration process just like now is not the time to Panic. I really enjoyed it um, and how, you know, working on the same thing in different phases of your life can mean completely different things, how your real life influences your art and vice versa. Uh, it was beautifully done. Some of the best character work I've seen in a while. I cried so much. A book has not made me cry like this in a very long time. <laughs> Holy moly. Part seven. If you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. Part seven, on the bathroom floor crying. Can't recommend it enough. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. My book club, let's talk about that. My book club is called the Bestiary Book Club. Um, if you don't know what a bestiary is, it used to be a word used for a medieval collection of animals put together. There are often fables and scientific uh, explanations, scientific explanations, myths, things like that surrounding animals. Um, and I named it this because, well, one, I'm an art history minor and I love medieval art. It's my favorite. Um, but also because I think we, as people, are also a collection of very diverse and interesting animals. So my book club, the Best Yearly Book Club, our theme for February is celebrating and elevating Black voices for Black History Month. And we are going to be reading Legend Born by Tracy Dion. I am, I am so excited. I've had it on my TBR for forever. Book two recently came out. You guys, this book follows Brie, who got into a special, uh, she's in high school, but she got into a special college program at UNC Chapel Hill, which is in North Carolina, not far from me. So I'm actually very excited. I feel like there's not a lot of books that take place in my area, so I'm excited to see it, um, how it's described in this book. It talks about facing prejudice when you're just a kid growing up in the South. It also has an incredible magic system, I've heard, and it gets into uh, like legends of King Arthur and his knights. So once again, going back to medieval stuff that I love, King Arthur, magic, present day, uh, Southern racism, talking about all these things. I am so excited. Um, book two recently came out bloodmarked. I can't wait. Can't wait to read this with you. If you want to join our book club, we are on Fable. I'll put all the links down below, of course. Fable is a really cool app. Um, it's free. It lets you 
leave comments by chapter so you don't have to worry about spoiling yourself and reading comments from the wrong space. We also have a Discord. You can leave all your uh, comments in there if you don't want to uh, get a fable also. We occasionally do some meet and greets and discussions about our books in Discord in the chat. Uh, or even like on video calls and stuff. I hope to do more if our book club gets bigger. So yeah, we'll be reading Legendborn. We'd love to have you. Um, so excited. Also for Black History Month, I'm going to be reading Ghost, which this is actually a um, book for very young readers. My friend gave it to me who is a sixth grade English teacher. I'm going to be reading Ghost. I'm going to, I downloaded a bunch. I downloaded Early Departures, Felix Ever After, and The Stars Beneath Our Feet. So if you're gonna read those two, or if you've read them before, I would love to talk to, to you about them. Let's celebrate and elevate Black voices. All right, now I want to mention a couple of books that came out this month that I'm very excited for that I have not gotten to yet. First, we have Song of Silver, Flame Like Night by Amelie Wynne Zhao. Fantasy, a little bit of romance, I believe, romanticy. Has a bunch of uh, Chinese-inspired myths and lore. So excited for this one. The cover is absolutely beautiful. I got a special pre-order that came with like some bookmarks and a special pin and um, prints and things like that. I'm just so excited to get into this world. I'm also really excited for the Davenports, which is a Bridgerton-esque like story that follows a black family in America. And I believe it's actually based on, uh, loosely based on a real historic family. So that will be really interesting. I, I love Bridgerton, so I'm really excited to see like an American version um, with a new family. So I, I'm really excited for this one. I'm also excited for Spice Road, which is an Arabic inspired fantasy. God Killer, which has, I, I believe it's also a fantasy, but has uh, a lot of folklore and mythology and is also LGBTQ. And Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. So here's just some books that recently came out. I haven't read any of them yet, but I am looking forward to it greatly. Thank you so much for watching. This is my first time trying to do anything booktube related, so I hope it was enjoyable. I hope you learned something, maybe got some good recommendations. I would love to hear from you, whether that's in our Discord or our Fable. Uh, I also have a bookstagram account at juliek.reads. Um, you can leave your recommendations or discussions in the comment section, of course. Uh, let me know if there's anything specific you'd want to see as far as videos go. I would love to do a top 10 books of 2022 video um, and maybe even lead some discussions with our book club books. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon. Remember you are loved and you are special. Happy reading everyone. Bye!